I'm going to tell you about what science tells you about how noise and acoustics affects pupils and affects teachers. So as a scientist, when I think about noise, what am I thinking of? Well, consider I'm in a classroom, I'm in a teacher teaching to my class here. What, what could be disturbing me? Well, we might have traffic noise. We might have planes coming in from overhead. We might have the noise of the playground. And all those sounds have different characteristics to them and potentially have different effects on our cognitive processes and affect learning in a different way. Within the school, of course, we have the noise from banging doors, say, in corridors. And of course, within my own classroom, you might start talking. I hope you don't today, but you might start talking and create babble. And if we add all those noises together, we get the cacophony that teachers have to compete with in their daily lives. So as a scientist looking at how noise affects pupils and teachers, these are the noises we're interested in. And so I'm going to take them one by one, not all of them, and have a look at the effects. So let's start with external noises. Let's start looking with planes. So if you happen to be under the flight path, your school is under the flight path, does that affect your learning? Well, potentially on average, it does. Now, one of the most influential studies was the Munich Airport study, where actually the airport got moved. And when they moved it, the pupils who had previously been under the flight path, their, their deficit in learning went away. And the, and the pupils subsected to the new flight paths, their learning slowed down. But we can look also within Britain, for example, and I suppose one of the most influential studies in this area is the Ranch study. And that showed that a five decibel drop in uh, a five decibel increase in aircraft noise is, uh, results in a two-month delay in reading ability on average. So I know there's quite a few acousticians in here, but I assume we're not all acousticians in here, and maybe five decibels doesn't mean much to you. So I'm going to play you an aircraft fly, flight path. I'm going to then take five decibels off it so you can hear what five decibels sounds like. So a bit quieter. So there's not really very much difference there to give you a two-month delay on average in reading ability. So there's some pretty solid evidence that planes have an effect on learning. What about outside? If you go outside today, you'll find it's complete gridlock outside the room. There's so much traffic. So what does traffic noise do on learning? Well, again, there's been another study looking at this, which has measured the levels outside schools and looked at the standard tests that were used at primary school at Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 and looked at, is there an effect on learning? Now, you have to allow for the fact that schools in disadvantaged areas who tend to have pupils who achieve less happen to be noisy schools. So if you allow for some this difference in the social economic makeup of your children, you can still find an effect for noise. And here's uh, a headline figure from the study on primary schools that a 10 decibel increase in external noise causes an average 5% in drop in SATs at key stage 1 and a 7% drop at key stage 2. So you can actually measure and you can plot graphs and show a definite effect on traffic noise, on, in this case, London primary schools. What does 10 decibel sound like? Well, to the acoustic experts, they might say, oh, it's a, a doubling in loudness. But I'm going to play it again to give you a sense of what it's like. So I'm going to play you some traffic rumble, and I'm going to put the level up by 10 dB. So it's, it's a big effect than we, we had before. So why are these external noises causing problems for learning? Well, imagine I'm teaching you and you're listening and there's traffic noise leaking in from outside. You've got my voice to listen to and you've got the traffic. Now, at the point of your ear canals, the, both sounds go down your ear canals and go and tweak the inner ear and, and make electrical signals. So it's down to your brain to actually separate out those two signals. It takes a cognitive effort to reduce the noise of the background traffic so you can hear the teacher. And this happens really automatically in hearing. It's quite a very clever skill. You may have, at the end of the day, turned the computer off and suddenly heard, oh, the fans disappeared. That's been on all the time. 
And you're doing this all the time, suppressing background noise level, but it takes energy, it takes cognitive power to do that. And there's a theory, there's the exact theory as to why this noise affects learning is unclear, but I suppose you can simply think of it as it's an extra load on the brain. But if it's there, it makes learning more difficult. So that's the external environment. And I suppose the question here is, is how difficult is it to solve that? external environmental problem, the planes and the trains. My argument would be it isn't difficult if there's political will. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, if you, um, if you uh, look at, um, uh, if you look at, I'll come back to that. Um, if you look at a, a measurement done in a classroom, then what we do is we have a, a experiment here where we have a set of pupils where we place different noises at them. And what we're going to look at is how it affects the pupils. So take a reading score, get a set of pupils, pretend you're primary school pupils, and play some noise at them, and see what happens in quiet conditions and noisy conditions. Well, in quiet conditions, you have a score, it doesn't matter where it is on the scale. Add some noise, and you find that typical pupils, the noise makes a difference, which is kind of the results I've been showing before. But what I'm really interested in this slide is what happens to kids with special educational needs. And they're much worse affected. So, Initially, kids with special educational needs achieve less on average, but add noise, and they are particularly disadvantaged. And so when we consider the effect of noise on children, we have to consider the effect it has not just on uh, typical pupils, but those with special educational needs. And I know in the first half, you looked at the issue of deaf children. Now, to come back to the point I was just making a second ago, how easy it is to solve this problem of noise and external noise? Well, actually, it's not very difficult. An example I'd like to give you is down the river, the Royal Festival Hall. Built in the 1950s, it's surrounded by subways, it's surrounded by uh, aircraft flying overhead, it's got roads, it's a noisy environment around there. Go into the middle of it, it's quiet. This is a building engineered in the 1950s. We knew 60 years ago how to achieve quiet in a building. What we need is to be prepared to pay the money, and have the political will to quieten the building to the level it needs to be. It's not new engineering that's needed, it's actually just a question of being prepared to uh, engineer it. So that's the external noise environment. What about within uh, the building? And I thought I'd talk a little bit about open plan schools. And for those who have not been in open plan school, these are schools where you have multiple classes in one area. This kind of plan you can see here has, um, essentially it's like a classroom where all the doors are missing. But you might also have one where you have a big hangar space and you have lots of different classes dotted around. Now, when I was a kid and I learnt science back in primary school, secondary school, I was told in physics that light goes in straight lines and sound goes around corners. Now, physics hasn't changed in the last 30 to 35 years. Sound still goes around corners. So you're still going to find sound leaking from one class area to the other. And these were a nightmare to try and design acoustically. Why? Because the acoustician can't change the physics. The, the sound will still want to go between these class bases. And so for, from an acoustic point of view, they're a nightmare to try and deal with. And it's much more better from an acoustic perspective to have cellular classrooms. And I'll give you an example of why you might think it's better from a cost reason, and that's Bexley Business Academy. So Bexley Business Academy was a flagship uh, academy built back, uh, I suppose it's about 10 years ago now. And um, unfortunately, it was an open plan school with acoustics which didn't work. So you had a big central atria with lots of uh, classrooms off to the side. And the classrooms off to the side didn't have walls on them. So what you had is you had noise leaking from the atria into the classroom and between classrooms. And it was so bad they had to go back and had to spend £600,000 to put glass partitions in. Because sound goes round corners, if you want to stop the sound, you need to physically put something heavy in the way, whether that's a par plasterboard partition or glass partition, if you want to stop the sound. And the effect that the sound has on individuals depends on what's leaking between the classrooms. Now, I remember uh, talking to a, a teacher who worked in an open plan school up in Manchester, who worked in English. He happened to be a, a friend of my uh, kids. And he said, it would be really nice if the English department had one door so I could play a video. And the reason is, is the effect of speaking, of single speakers, is much worse than the effect of having multiple people speaking. And I can give you a demonstration of that by building up some sound for you, so you can hear what the effect is. So I'm going to play you one person talking, two person, four person, eight person. And what you need to do is listen to the sound and think, 
how damaging this might be to learning. So here's one person. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. In, in language, arithmetic, infinitely, infinitely many, many, many numbers can be composed from letters. just a few digits in with Base. Infinitely many words can be replaced by five and six letters are said to be very rare. So when you start off with one talker, you could clearly hear the words, obviously. It's like listening to someone in a train having a mobile phone conversation. That's very damaging to learning. And the reason is, if I'm sitting reading, and I'm trying to actually read a passage. I'm using the same cognitive powers, because actually when you read in your brain, you're effectively reading out loud. It's the same cognitive powers you need to actually interpret speech coming in. So your brain is having to deal with two similar signals at the same time. It finds it hard to separate those out and control for them. The other reason is because speech is rather interesting. And actually our hearing developed first of all as an early warning system. And so therefore anything really interesting we tend to latch on. That's the reason if we had a police siren go down the outside here, we would all stop listening to me and listen to the police siren. Hopefully it'd all come back and come back to task and listen to me. But initially you think, danger, I need to know what that is. And so single speakers, a single video playing in one class base influencing another class base is very damaging to learning. Once you got up to eight people, it was all a mush. It doesn't really matter. It's, it is still influencing learning, but it's not really any different in terms of the, its effect on the brain than, say, traffic noise. And I think the last thing I want to kind of come to then is look at the internal environment in classrooms. Because, of course, in a normal class, you're all sitting here nice and quietly and being very obedient. In a normal class, you get the noise of the, of the pupils, especially uh, if they're doing group work. And so what happens when you have babble in the classroom? Because inevitably, the children chat. Uh, well, we've done some work on secondary schools. And in this case, this experiment here, we have pupils with headphones on, and we're playing different levels of noise at them. And we're seeing how their, again, reading comprehension varies. And there's two age groups here. You've got on the left-hand side, you've got 11 to 13-year-olds. On the right-hand side, you've got 14 to 16-year-olds. And if you look just at the, what happens when you add noise, you find that as you add noise, go from quiet to noisy, it doesn't matter the age group, you find that attainment goes down. The same results we've seen already, but at secondary school. Why it's interesting to look at secondary schools is, of course, what's happening and what you're having to learn, and learning styles are changing, but also cognitively your brain changes a lot during adolescence. The interesting result also from this, which is uh, slightly coincidental, but I think is quite interesting, is that actually if you look at what happens between the older pupils in noise and the younger pupils in choir, is they attain very similar. So by adding this babble, this was internal babble noise for a classroom, we can knock two, three years off of attainment from these pupils. So it's coincidental where that is, but it's quite a nice demonstration of what goes on when there's noise in a classroom. So what do we do about this babble? Well, I thought rather than do it myself, I'll get my twin to explain why this, this internal noise is a problem and how to deal with it. If you had to teach outdoors, you'd find it really hard to talk to a big class, because as I talk, the sound just disappears into the field. A big reverberant space, like a cathedral, is also poor acoustics for a classroom. The sound is trapped, and it bounces and echoes around. Words run into each other and create a mush. Imagine if I had a class in here, all talking, how the noise would build up. You might strain your voice trying to get above the babble. Ideal is a classroom like this, where you've got some hard walls to provide some reflections, but you've also got some soft stuff so it doesn't echo around too long. Here I can talk to the pupils and not have to strain my voice. So when we're talking about the science of what, how noise affects pupils, we must remember there's also internal acoustic treatments that are needed to actually keep the level of pupil noise down as well, because pupil noise is quite dominant, especially at primary school level. Now, in that little discussion, I mentioned the teacher's voice a few times, because we shouldn't just uh, think about pupils, we should also think about what happens to teachers. And we can look at figures like 70% of primary school teachers have had voice problems. Or you can look at one particular case. This is someone who was compensated by £150,000 because they strain their voice by repeatedly talking in noisy classrooms. So it's not just the pupils that suffer, it's also the teachers. Which leads me to an interesting quote, which is, um, some recent schools are surprisingly noisy. 
The modern architectural methods used do not help in neutralizing sounds. Teachers have frequent attacks of laryngitis, which I'm sure a lot of teachers would relate to, but what I find shocking about this quote is it's from 1948. So we have, been, we have had problems in classrooms for that many years. We've known the science of how to cure them, and yet we haven't done it.